So it's an honor for me now to introduce our first, to introduce our first speaker, Professor Christine Parler, who holds the Sylvan C. Coleman Chair in Finance at the House Business School in Berkeley. Christine, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I want to do is I want to ramble a little bit about things that haven't happened yet, but could well be happening in the world of crypto and financial architecture. So we all know about decentralized ledgers. This is a new way of sharing and trans transferring information. And as we all know, these dis distributed ledgers enable cryptocurrencies. So there's obviously been a huge amount of popular attention to all the different cryptocurrencies out there and these incredible returns at no risk, apparently, um, sorts of things. What I think is actually very interesting and is probably going to be the more enduring part of this is what potentially distributed ledgers can do to the financial architecture. And in particular, the sorts of things that are now being developed in this decentralized finance space are things that are going to affect clearing and settlement. They're things that are going to affect how we trade, and they're things that are going to affect margins and collateral. While these might seem somewhat mechanical and perhaps uninteresting, what is very specific about what's happening in decentralized finance is new types of business models for all of these elements are, are emerging, and the risk and reward to the different participants, how they're balanced, is changing. So risk is shifting from intermediaries to markets and back again. And I think everyone who works in this space has to really think about what's coming down um, the gangplank, as it were. So the first thing that I want to address is stable coins. Stable coins obviously are a way of transferring value, and they've had a phenomenal increase, and they're phenomenally successful. So the first stable coins that we saw arose somewhere in 2014, and they arose just from a very, very big business need, which was the difficulty of taking fiat currency and buying and selling on some of these exchanges for cryptocurrencies. Once stable coins were in operation, people realized that they had all sorts of other uses. The way in which we pay, in particular cross-border and for larger amounts, let's just say, is somewhat inefficient. There are huge rents associated with handling or being part of the payment system. And stable coins in some way could get around this, and they've been incredibly successful. So anecdotally, there's evidence that contracts are being written in stable coins. People are paying, cross-border payments are flowing in stable coins. So there's clearly a big business need for efficient payments. The, the success of stable coins has really spurred this discussion that all the central bankers are having about central bank digital currency, because they're essentially worried about being crowded out of payments. They feel central banks have an obligation to handle uh, the payment system, and they don't want the private sector to take it over completely, which is why we have this sort of huge discussion about central bank digital currencies. So, so far, there have been three types of stable coins. They're fiat collateralized. These actually act a lot like money market funds. So you give them a piece of fiat, and they give you a digital thing that you can then move around um, in the ether, as it were. They're crypto collateralized. These work sort of the same way, but instead of having fiat back, instead of being fiat backed, they're backed by cryptocurrencies. And finally, the ones that have got, garnered a huge amount of attention are the ones that are al algorithmic stable coins. Um, these essentially act like private central banks, and as you might expect, they haven't been stunningly successful. Um, there have been some issues with the fiat-backed stablecoins. So very famously, uh, Tether and Bitfinex ran into trouble with the New York Attorney General. Um, and this has led to a wave of transparency, if you will. The, the backing of these stablecoins are now regularly audited. 
and all the different stablecoins, to some extent, are competing on transparency and auditability. Hugely successful. All of these sorts of hiccups and uh, problems seem to have had little or no effect on stablecoins in general. The blue line that you see here is the aggregate amount of stablecoins. Uh, the black, which is the next one down, which is Tether, which is the largest. And below that, um, gray, I think I would call it, is USDC, uh, which is uh, backed by Circle and Coinbase. So these are um, extremely successful. Because of the success of these standalone stablecoins, there's been a lot of discussion among regulated entities about how they're going to react to what is, in fact, a competitive threat. So, for example, JP Morgan has an internal coin that it uses, essentially, one can think of it, to economize on the working capital that exists underneath its umbrella. Um, to some extent, the JP Morgan coin is not, in fact, a transfer of value. It's more like an internal messaging service like SWIFT, and basically what it does is it allows JP Morgan to keep balances within JP Morgan that would otherwise have to be moved across entities. That's one experiment. Another experiment is something called USDF. This is a small set of banks in upstate New York. They have a system that is based on the provenance blockchain, which is an enterprise-grade blockchain. And what it does is it issues stable coins that are backed not by fiat, but are backed by deposits. So deposits obviously are regulated things, and those are um, issued when um, consumers want to make payments. The issuing bank, um, the bank takes the deposit, issues one of these uh, new stable coins. The stable coins are then used for bank-to-bank -bank instantaneous settlement. The back end, the wholesale payment system, still goes through FedNow but the bank-to-bank -bank is going through these stable coins. The selling point for this, as far as retail customers is concerned, is that potentially these stable coins could in fact have programmable features. You could have uh, delivery against payment. You can have contractual features embedded in the payments. So this is yet another type of innovation, and it's essentially regulated in, um, industries or regulated firms hitting back against the private stablecoins. So this is a huge active area of innovation. Regulation is, is following up on what's happening in the stablecoin market. And there are two sort of regulatory thrusts. MECAR in the EU, which I realize has got absolutely nothing to do with the UK, but just roll with it. And the other is stablecoin trust, which is in the US. And essentially, the way the regulators are thinking about it is they're saying, OK, we know that all these people are going to be issuing stable coins. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that the payment system is stable. And so what we're going to do is require that all assets that back stable coin, issued stable coins are segregated and are in ultra safe assets. Right? So basically, this is sort of how the regulators are thinking about it. And so the first set of questions that I want to throw out is, well, what effect is something like this, stablecoin innovation, going to have on banks and the banking system that we think, to some extent, are the backbones of the financial system? Well, this is going to have a huge impact on banks. So at the moment, banks have pools of capital that come about because people need to make payments, and so they have money sitting at a bank because they know that they're going to be making payments through those accounts. Let's suppose that that money now moves into a different realm, which is the stablecoin realm. First of all, this is going to affect banks' demand for deposit, interbank deposit settlements, which is central bank reserves. This is going to have an equilibrium effect on essentially the cost of transferring reserves between banks. So it's going to have a short-term, essentially, uh, what we see in the money market effect. Two, 
Banks who are the natural lenders in the economy will no longer be sitting on all the information that comes because flows into and out of these deposit accounts are informative about credit risk. Where does that information go? And who is now going to be making those loans? This is potentially a loss to the economy. This is something else that will happen. Third, if you think about it, one thing that banks do is they take these deposits and they make loans. They use the information that they have to make loans to worthwhile businesses, positive NPV projects, we like to say. If it is, in fact, the case, that the banks are no longer holding those pools of capital, but instead those pools of capital are sitting with stablecoins, and those stablecoins are regulated and being forced to essentially put their money into safe assets, i.e. government debt. What you have is a world where money has moved from the banking sector, which was doing its business of maturity transformation and lending to small businesses, that money is now shifted into some sort of entity that is being forced to essentially lend to the government. Where does the growth in the economy come from if banks are not making lending to small businesses? This is something that we should think about. This is going to be a change that comes down the gangplank if it is, in fact, the case that stablecoins become the way that people transfer value. The other thing that stablecoins do that is remarkable, is they essentially allow delivery against payment. None of this nonsense about having to wait two days to settle. Stable coins, because they are native digital, allow you to exchange one digital asset for another. One of the ways in which decentralized finance has allowed people to transfer value is through what is known as automated market makers. Automated market makers are a completely new form of liquidity provision and trading. How does that work? Anything, any securities market, you have buyers and sellers of the asset. In addition, and we don't talk about it that much, you have buyers and sellers of liquidity or immediacy. Automated market makers split those two functions in a very, very specific way. They segregate the people who are willing to supply immediacy against the people who are willing to demand liqui uh, immediacy or liquidity. This is different from buying and selling the asset. You can do both on either side, but it's the people who are demanding and supplying immediacy. The other thing that these automated market makers do is they remove the sort of uh, price discovery aspect of markets. We usually think that prices are discovered in markets. Automated market makers don't necessarily operate that way. How do they work, for those who don't know? Essentially, these are structured as bilateral swap pools. So think about a world where you want to trade Ethereum, ETH, against some token T. If you're a liquidity supplier, so you supply liquidity, what you do is you add Ethereum and token in, in equal proportion to a pool, and it just sits there. You get a receipt for that, and you can keep that receipt and then cash it in at any time if you want to withdraw your tokens. The person who wants to trade the other, the other side, the person who demands liquidity and wants to exchange, for example, ETH for the token or the token for ETH, um, basically just goes in and uses those pools of liquidity to effectuate the trade. What's sort of unusual about these things is the price impact is deterministic. Right? How does it work? Price impact is a design feature of the exchange. The simplest is just sort of this nice downward sloping curve. Think about a world where if you enter um, a world where the pool has got E0 ETH and T0 tokens. You're sitting there. Okay? And let's suppose that you want to sell tokens. What are you going to do? You're going to deposit them. So let's suppose that you want to sell the difference between T0 and T1. You dump those into the pool. 
In order to keep the pool on this nice downward sloping curve, the amount that you take out, essentially what you get for selling your tokens, is the difference between E0 and E1. It's completely deterministic. Right? Looks kind of weird. Does it work? It works amazingly well. They work amazingly well. Um, this just gives you a graph that shows the price of USDC against Ethereum relatively, uh, so over a, a day, intraday prices. October 21st, 2020 uh, was chosen because it's my co-author's wife's birthday, and that was a special um, year for them, so anyway. Um, the two lines, what are they? Um, the blue line is Binance, which is a large centralized exchange that op operates as an open electronic limit order book. The orange line is Uniswap, which is one of these automated market makers. And really surprisingly, these two lines are coincident, or pretty much coincident. And what that tells you is that even though you have this strange environment in which there's this mechanical uh, curve that determines prices, the system works so that these prices are relatively aligned. The other thing that people care about when it comes to trading is how expensive it is to trade. Well, it turns out that if you look at price impact, so the change in price for a change in quantity, and compare it between Binance and one of these automated market makers, it turns out that the price impact on Binance, which is in this case represented by the blue spikes, is much, much larger than the price impact on one of these automated market makers. Where's the price impact on these automated market makers? Well, you can hardly see it. It's the little green line at the bottom and the orange line. The difference between the two, one is empirical, the other is just calculated from this curve. Obviously, these are very difficult to interpret because the choice of where you trade, there's all sorts of complicated decision making that goes into it. But what it tells you is that these automated market makers which at first glance from people who are in finance just look nuts, actually have properties that sort of make a lot of sense. They seem to work. And as you know, um, things that work tend to be adopted. And sure enough, there have been some entities that have asked for regulatory approval to use these kind of mechanisms to trade existing securities. I think this is something that's going to be coming down the gangplank. Again, we should think about it. So what effect would having something like these automated market makers widely adopted? What would happen? Well, all sorts of things. Uh, pretty much all the, the incentives to, say, collect information, uh, the incentives to supply liquidity, um, all of these things differ from traditional market structures. So things will change. How? We don't know exactly, but it's something to be aware of. Um, because there is delivery against payment in these markets, everything is digital. You don't have to wait for two days for things to clear. Failure to deliver is something that just completely goes away. You can't trade unless you've got the corresponding asset. Right? There are going to be equilibrium effects on short sale markets, of course. Right? Liquidity is posted beforehand. So you're not essentially making up shares the way you do on uh, traditional, say, market-making markets. Fat-fingered errors become much more of an issue. Oops, right? You've got delivery against payment. Basically, you can't go back and erase problems. Or if you have problems, um, they can be magnified very quickly. So these are all things that have to be considered. The final set of issues that I just want to sort of um, address are collateral and margins. So one of the things that we do, or one of the, the really big functions in financial markets, is um, trying to manage risk. One of the ways in which we manage risk is through collateral, right? Having something of value that we can use in case of default. And so there are a couple of interesting examples 
of collateral management that look very, very different. Biggest example is in what is known as um, uh, these um, uh, lending protocols, um, in particular Aave and Compound. These act like intermediaries in swap markets. What is different about Aave and Compound is that they bear absolutely no risk. The protocols are designed so the risk flows to either the borrowers or the lenders. So how do these things work? Roughly, um, lenders just deposit crypto into a vault um, and they can withdraw at any time. Uh, the borrowers um, uh, deposit crypto into a smart contract, so they're borrowing another crypto against crypto. The reason why the platforms bear absolutely no risk is because both the borrowers and the lenders are exposed to very, very high frequency floating rates. So as it becomes clear that there are not enough borrowers, some, suddenly the lenders have to pay way more and so forth. So this is supposed to provide incentives to make sure that the two sides are balanced. And when I say high, fre uh, high frequency, I mean seven seconds, because it happens at the block speed of the Ethereum protocol. What I want to focus on um, in this system, and it's a fascinating system, is liquidations. So typically, you know, if I'm borrowing money from you, uh, you're going to want my collateral, right? And so you're going to be sitting on it, and you're going to decide when to pull the trigger. In these protocols, the trigger is pulled by the market. So third parties are ones who are monitoring the collateral. FTX, before the giant explosion, um, was basically talking about trying to introduce these types of collateral management systems in tradi tra traditional futures contracts in the US. Um, obviously, FTX is really not interacting with regulators in that way anymore, uh, but it's quite possible that somebody else will come up with this idea. So how do these things work? Well, let's just think about um, somebody who has deposited collateral and taken out a loan. And what are these different lines? The blue line is collateral, and so that's the value of the collateral. The orange line is the value of debt. Right? Collateral value, these are over-collateralized. The collateral value is higher than the, collateral of the, 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 the debt value. The green line is what we call a health factor. And basically, the way these smart contracts operate is if the health factor is below uh, one, the market can move in and start to uh, seize the, pay off the debt and seize the collateral. And sure enough, in this particular example, they're, they're, the debt was in terms of Tether, USDT, so they paid it off, they seized the collateral, they get it at a discount, so they have incentives to do so. They swapped it out immediately on one of these decentralized exchanges, they paid the transaction fees, and they ended up with a mere $878. Um, but on the same day, they did 42 other loans, and this is something that they did every day. This is a robot, so it's pretty, once you, once you have it programmed, it's just a stream of uh, cash that comes from this. If you look at the effect of these markets, these differences, these sort of different um, uh, collateral management systems, all sorts of things look different than they do in traditional markets. So um, you get deleveraging, which propagates across the system. Right? Um, you have price impacts on collateral right? uh, that actually has measurable effects on the return distributions of collateral. And you see uh, loan liquidators essentially not internalizing the benefit of keeping a relationship with the customer going forward, but basically thinking about their own profit. Okay. That's nothing wrong with it, but it just changes the incentives. Okay. So just to give you some quick, quick sort of pictures about this, this basically represents 100 liquidations of li the LINK token, so this is Chainlink, on, uh, in May 2021. And 
Basically, uh, the red line is what the price should have been from just these automated market makers, so going down that curve. And uh, the blue, orange, and green lines basically are um, the prices from this particular token on different automated market makers. There are multiple automated market makers. And pretty much, as you can see, floating along, bang, we have the liquidations, and suddenly we get these sort of permanent price impacts. Right? Um, a lot of this has to do with how these systems are structured. They're sort of internal feedback loops. Um, this gives you another example that's perhaps easier to follow. And this shows uh, some wrapped Bitcoin that are liquidated. What's really, really interesting about this is the blue line represents the net position of the liquidator. We know it's a liquidator because we can just see their wallet. This, this is who is initiating the trade. And what's sort of interesting is the blue line goes below zero. What does that mean? Basically, it means that they had a stock of this collateral in their portfolio, and they started selling. They started selling, it had price impacts, and because basically the prices are fed back into these health factors, essentially what that did is it pushed the health factors down, and then they could move in and seize collateral. Right? Right? So what they're doing is they're pushing things into default. And uh, this seems to be pervasive. These kinds of effects um, can actually be seen in the prices of some of these collateral assets. So the difference between the two distributions is just what the return distribution looks like if there are no liquidations for a particular uh, currency, compared to the return distributions if there are liquidations. And they essentially have fatter tails, right? So more extreme events um, are likely. So what have we learned from all this? There's a lot going on, and we don't know much about it. Um, some of it's really good. Automating processes typically reduces the cost of those processes. And in particular, this wave of digitization has reduced the cost of uh, exchanging value. Right? But what it's also done is it's changed or it's made different sorts of business structures possible, right? Completely new ways of doing things. Um, and one of the things that possibly will happen is that risk and who holds the risk is going to move from intermediaries to markets and move from different, across different market participants. That means that we have to think very carefully about regulation whether or not it's actually we're regulating the right entity and to the correct degree. And two, when it comes to our finance models and how we think about risk and return, to make sure uh, that we're actually understanding how the incentives have changed because of these new systems. Thank you. <laughs>